So let's go to Revelation chapter 2, please. Revelation chapter 2. The promises to the overcomers. Promises to the overcomers. We left off with, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And Revelation adds what the Spirit says to the churches. Not only for us today, for them at that time, but for all, all of eternity. These words are there for all God's people to know. And there are tremendous promises to the overcomer. And we're going to read them in a, minute, in a minute here. Because every letter to the churches has a promise to the overcomer. Look at verse 7 of chapter 2. He who has ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant them to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Look at chapter 2. And look at verse uh, 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be heard by the second death. So no, not only do we have the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God, that is, of course, Jesus, the cross of Jesus, the etern eternal life that we have in him. Not only that, but we're also going to escape the second death. We will not be hurt by the second death. Look at chapter 2 again. Look at the last part. In uh, verse 17, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give him with a hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. Not only are we promised a new name, the resurrection, a new nature, which we already have in Christ Jesus through the new birth. We have a new nature. We have a new name, just like Paul, just like Jacob. We get a new name. We're also going to get a new name in heaven which we will know what that is, and we'll get a white stone. Most people, on, uh, most commentators are divided what the white stone is. I'm not here to settle the issue, because I don't really know. And uh, if you really want to know, Jacob doesn't either. <laughs> I guess I'm a good company. Yeah. The best, as I could surmise, it's something to do with the resurrection and the purity and the holiness of God through that comes through the Holy Spirit because of the white, 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 uh, white garments, uh, the white stone, white throne of judgment, we see this idea of the purity and the nature of God being brought forth through the new birth, and we'll have a resurrection. But that's not the only promise. Look at the promise to Thyatira in verse uh, chapter 2. And, um, boy, verse 24, but I rest, uh, put to the rest of you there in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the depth, uh, deep things of Satan, and they will call upon, uh, and they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. He who overcomes, he who keeps my deeds until the end, always until the end, always until the end, I will give him authority over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron and the vessels, uh, as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, I will also receive authority from my father. I will give him the morning star. This is again, all pictures of Jesus, the promises. Of course, he is the bright and morning star. We will have unity with Christ forever and ever. We will have authority over the nations. This is quoted from Psalm 2, the, uh, a great Psalm. If you read it on your own, tempted to go on it for a minute, but we have so much to cover. Psalm 2, the Psalm of the King. God is going to give, put his son on his holy hill to be the king over all the nations. He laughs at the nations and what they're doing. Uh, it's comical to me. He laughs at the UN. He laughs at NATO. He laughs at the White House. He laughs at Parliament. He laughs at all the kings of the earth who are trying to enthrone themselves in this world as the kings of the earth. Well, the kings of the earth are going to have a surprising ending yeah. to them. Not to us, because we know yeah. what Jesus is going to do with the nations. He will rule over them. But look, look who's promised to rule over them. Those who overcome, Absolutely. he will give them authority over the nations and, and rule them and, and uh, basically says, as the vessels of the potters are broken into pieces. Thyatira was a major center of a lot of guilds, of a lot of... Um, merchants and a lot of people that had trades. So they had pottery trades, they had painting trades, they had tailors. They would have known about the pottery trades in Thyatara and that there was a major, major uh, center of pottery at the time and they, all the guilds had their god. They had their gods. And so this is again a shot at, um, at the guilds and at the uh, revelation that the, in Thyatara they worship Caesar. They worship Caesar and they worshiped him as the son of God. And Jesus comes to Thyatira and says, no, I am the son of God. Remember Caesar 
thought of himself as being the descendant of Zeus, being the son of God, being the son of the Most High God in their pantheon. And Jesus says, no, I'm the son of God, and I'm going to break them like a potter's vessel. So this is specifically for Thyatira, but we understand it a little more. Chapter 3, we did that today. Chapter 3 and verse uh, 5, He who overcomes shall thus be clothed with white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. To the church of Philadelphia, verse 12, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will go out no more, and I will write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven, from my God and my new name. Three things that are promised, incredible promise. Uh, while the Antichrist will write his name on people, God has written his name on his own people. Did you notice that part right there? I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes out of heaven from my God, and my new name, says the Lord. We will belong to him. Satan will have his mark. We'll have ours. And that comes from Christ. Uh, verse 21 of chapter 3, He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat, with, uh, and sat down with my father on his throne. Interesting promise to the worst of the churches, I guess we could put it. The Laodicea promised to rule and reign with Christ. Whoever overcomes, whoever overcomes, even in that church, he will give them authority to sit with him on his throne because he overcame. So the promise is to overcomers. Why will we overcome? Because Jesus has already overcome, and he promises that if you do the same, they are promises of eternal life. First of all, eternal life. So let's be clear one thing for sure. When you read these texts, there's no doubt and hopefully we could be in agreement, but if we don't, I still love you. We can chat afterwards. <laughs> Only the people that overcome yeah. will have eternal life. Yeah. We're okay with that. Okay. Yeah. Don't I want a consensus just for having consensus, but only the people that overcome will have eternal life. Yeah. It's very specific, and it's the last book of the Bible for that very reason. And letting us know at the end of the day, at the end of everything, in the summation of history of humanity, you have to overcome. What do we have to overcome? Well, whatever we have to do, we have to overcome. Whatever it takes, we have to overcome. And this is the promise of eternal life to those who believe in Christ Jesus that we overcome. We can put it this way. Christianity is much more than just believing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people could believe. And I guess evangelical Protestantism, which is um, the country that I'm from, um, that's a big center of it as well as this country, evangelical Protestantism, says that you must believe only. That you must believe. Only believe. Revelation says you must believe, but you have to overcome, which comes from belief, which comes from the very fact that we believe. If we didn't believe, we didn't have to overcome. But the fact that you believe, now we have to put it into action. Now we have to put it into practice, and that comes to overcome. What do we have to overcome? Turn to Revelation 21, the end of the book. Just to let you know that it's not just sprinkled in the middle or in the beginning. It's all through the book of Revelation. Revelation 21, verse 7. At the end, at the end right before the new Jerusalem. This is what it says, verse 7. He who overcomes, same theme, hasn't changed. The author, the Holy Spirit, John, keeps writing as he's listening to what is being told he who overcomes shall inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But look at the opposite, and this is the key part to overcome. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, in other words, the unfaithful, we could be translated that, the abominable, the murderers, immoral persons, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars will have their part in the lake of fire, the burns with fire, and brimstone, which is the second death. Remember one of the promises, you will not be hurt by the second death? Well, here's the overcoming promise. You will not be hurt by the second death if you overcome, but those who don't are the cowardly, the unfaithful, those who practice these things, the abominable murder and moral person and sorcerers and idolaters. One of the things we have to overcome, my friend, and there's no doubt about it all through the Bible, we must overcome sin. And I wrote it that way because I is always in the middle of sin. To get that part, I is in the middle. I 
you, I, is in the middle of sin. We must overcome sin. Jesus came to deliver us from sin. His name will be Jesus because he will save his people from, his, from their sins. Make no doubt about it. Jesus came to deliver us from sin. That's why he came, to die for us. Now, there's many aspects of that, but that's one of the central themes of Scripture, to deliver us from our sins, disobedience, transgression, uh, many things that the Bible calls it, transgression, trespass. Uh, there's also iniquity. All these things are bottled into the idea of sin. We must overcome sin. Now, the idea here is the cowardly, it says. The cowardly. What is the cowardly in the unbelieving? What does that have to do with it? Before it starts mentioning things that we would consider sin, like uh, the abominable murder of moral person sources and idolatry, he mentions two things. He mentions those who are cowardly. Those who don't go on with Jesus and are afraid of keep trusting him, especially in difficult times, the cowardly, they're not trusting the Lord. They will go back into the world or they won't continue in their faith because they're, they're afraid to live as a Christian. And my friend, one point in our lives, it's uh, being a Christian is not going to be a matter of coming to church. One point in our lives over the next years, it's not going to be about coming to church. It's going to be whether or not we're going to be faithful even unto death. And that's what's going to be the real test that's coming to the, not only to the Western world, but to the body of Christ. It's not going to be about going to church only. That's easy, isn't it? And most of us can't make it to church sometimes, right? <laughs> but it, that's an easy part. Going to church, being a Christian... But what about when your life is at risk? And you say, well, we're safe and secure here on a Saturday evening in the UK. But what about those who today in the persecuted world are being hunted down for the sake of being a Christian? For them, it's not an issue of going to church. It's an issue of life and of death, of faithfulness or being unfaithful. God says here, he who overcomes, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, it's about faithfulness. Here's the word opposite, unfaithful. Those who are unfaithful, unfaithful to what you believe, unfaithful to continue on what you believe. Uh, what you believe you must put into practice. But if you're unfaithful, you won't do it. You maybe believe the right things. You maybe acknowledge the right things and agree with the right things. But is your life according to God? Is your life according to to the scriptures. That's a different thing. That's called faithfulness, my friend. Not just in agreement with facts, which we all could agree. I could give you a statement of faith. You could all check the boxes and we'll all be very happy because we all check the same boxes, I would hope. But another issue would be, are we living it? Is it faithfulness? Is there faithfulness in your life? When trouble happens, where do you go? Do you draw back? and resort back to the old man, to the old life, to the old ways, to the world? Or do you put your trust in, in God and says, no matter what happens, I am not moving. I am not moving from this area until he moves me. Until he moves me, I will not move. I will not be moved. That says, that's what the song says from the Psalms. So those are the overcomers. The real issue that you have to overcome is the sins. The sins, the abominable, the murder. Basically, those who get caught up in sin. The responsibility of every Christian is to overcome sin. There is no doubt that the Christian has a choice whether they sin or not. Before we came to Jesus, we didn't have a choice. Now that we've come to Christ, we have a choice. Because of the new birth, we can literally say no to sin. We can resist any temptation. God will not give us a temptation much more than we could overcome, much more than we can handle. He is faithful to that. But we have a way out. And Paul uses a beautiful word of a road. It says a way out. God gave you a way out. And it was a, a, a word that was used for the Roman Empire. In the Roman Empire, the, the army would go through an area. And if the enemies were surrounding them, they will send a scout. And a scout will go out. And he will find a way out. And that's the word that Paul uses. And sometimes it was over a hill. Sometimes it was a difficult road. It was some treacherous road. But he says, if you take this road, you'll be out of the, out of the, out of the problem, out of the danger. You will live. And the Roman general would say, troops, through that way. And they would trek through that way and get out of harm's way. Well, that's what the word Paul uses. God is faithful to give you a way out. It might not be convenient. It might be a difficult way out but he will surely give you a way out. We can't 
say no, we can say no to sin. We don't have to sin anymore. Because of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, we can overcome sin. So literally, when I sin, it's my choice. I have decided not to trust God at that moment and to resort to something else or to someone else rather than God. That's what the Bible calls unfaithfulness or not trusting in God or to basically not continue in the faith that you know. So our faith is not in people. Our faith is not in things. Our faith is in the living God who can deliver us from sin. He can still deliver us from sin. Those who overcome will have eternal life, but they will also will overcome sin. Another thing we have to overcome, and this is a big one, and we'll spend some time on this too, to overcome in the area of truth and error. False concepts of God. False concepts of God. Are we overcoming regarding the false concepts and false teachings regarding God, regarding Jesus, regarding the scripture? Turn to Revelation chapter 15. Another overcoming. Aren't you glad you came? Overcome, overcome, overcome. It's going to be drummed into us. We're going to have to sing a song after this. So who overcome. Chapter 15, verse 1. Revelation chapter 15, verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels who, uh, great and marvelous, seven angels who had seven plagues, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. Verse 2. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who had uh, come off victorious from the beast, from his image, and from the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, holding harps of God. And they sang a song, the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Now, what is this from? Very similar to Exodus 15. In fact, it is exactly the scene from Exodus 15. Let me paint the picture. Moses has led the people, a couple million people out of Egypt into the promised land. They go through the Red Sea, the sea departs, and then you got the Pharaoh army coming through, the Egyptian army, and the sea closes in, the Red Sea closes in, the Pharaoh's army is destroyed, and Israel's on the other side, looking back and saying, did you see that? Did you? That's my translation. But did you, did you see that? I would have been me. I can't believe it. God has delivered us. And we didn't have to fight anything. We literally just have to walk in the faith and believing that God was going to part the sea. And we have that uh, sort of saying, right? God's going to have to part the Red Sea for this situation, right? But that's where it comes from. This is the miracle. God sees them through the Red Sea. And they're standing on the other side. And they sing a song, and it's Miriam and Moses and the children of Israel, tambourines, and they sing how marvelous God had delivered them. In fact, this is really big in the Jewish community, even in the synagogues today when they read it, if they read it. Uh, even chapter 15 of Exodus, it's sort of a, written in this sort of wavy paper. They read it because it's like the waves of the sea. It's kind of cute how they do that, but I like it because it, it gives pictures to the to the text and here you go standing on the other side and they sing a song and then chapter 15 of revelation same thing same story but this time it's not pharaoh it's another like pharaoh look what they overcome verse 2 they come they overcome their victory is over the beast his image and the number of his name those who come through the great tribulation will stand on the other side of the sea of glass and will sing this song because God has been so good to deliver us from the beast, from the image, and from uh, the number of his name. Now, some of the things are very interesting because here you have a very interesting picture. Three things that, the, that we will overcome the Antichrist. Now, the question has always been this, and this is where I get a lot of flack, perhaps, in my country. I can't believe the church will be here when the Antichrist is. What are you talking about, Pastor? This is crazy. I mean, you're talking about really 666? I mean, we're, we're going to be gone before this time, right? Right? No. But the question they ask me. And I have to break it to them. But I have to break it to them very gently because we ought to be with gentleness and humility. Each, all people with great patience. 
patience, with great patience, says Paul. And so turn, let's turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Does the Bible indicate that Christians will be around when the Antichrist shows up? Well, certainly from Revelation chapter 15, whoever overcame them were not Muslims. They were not um, New Agers. They seem to be Christians from Revelation 15. Christians have overcome the beast, his image, and the number of his name. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, please. A very direct passage into what Paul is referring to here in Revelation. Uh, John is writing Revelation, but Paul is referring to something that Jesus had taught before in Matthew 24. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Now, this is concerning the coming of the Lord, so maybe we we'll read it from verse 1 so nobody gets uh, upset or confused. Now, we request you, brethren, with regards to the coming of our Lord Jesus, the coming, the parousia, number one word that is used for the return of Jesus, parousia, right? The parousia, his coming. The coming of our Lord Jesus, by the way, this very same word is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In the coming of Jesus, Paul uses the same word, parousia. So regarding that, the Thessalonians already knew what Paul was referring to. This is the second letter to clarify some issues. Am I losing sound? Yeah. Uh, perhaps it's me, or perhaps it's not the matter. Okay, let's continue. Thessalonians chapter 2. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. Episunagoge simply means we are being gathered together to Christ. Matthew 24 uses a similar word that Jesus will come. And the Bible says in Matthew 24, Jesus says they will come and gather his life from all the corners of the earth. Same idea. There'll be a gathering. I think I'm losing the mic, but nobody's in the back there. So, um, Joshua, I think we're losing, uh, it's kind of breaking up on the mic. I'm not sure if it's me. It may be my metal plate. Sounds good? Okay. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Our gathering together to him. Verse 2. That you may not be quickly shaken from your composure or disturbed either by spirit, a message, or a letter, as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Notice that the day of the Lord is always connected to the coming of Jesus. It's an event that happens. Um, more than likely, it's the... Uh, some people say it's the same day, but what I say, it it's happens one before the other. It's an ushering in, the coming of the Lord, and then the day of the Lord begins. And it says here that don't be quickly shaken from a spirit, a message, or a letter. There were some forgeries, and there were some messages within the church uh, regarding Paul's first letter. And there was false messages within Thessalonians that they were saying, nope. You missed the coming of the Lord. We are already in the day of the Lord, and Paul is here to clarify some things that he thought he clarified in the first letter, so he has to write a second letter to make sure people don't misunderstand because some people had quit their jobs. Some people had mistakenly uh, um, read the first letter, and they said, well, Jesus has come. We, you know, Jesus is coming. We quit our jobs. That's why the third chapter of 2 Thessalonians, it's all about work. Work, work, work before Jesus comes. Don't be lazy. Don't be lazy. That's what the Bible says. Continue. Continue until he comes. Verse 3. Let no, one, let no one in any way deceive you. See, you shouldn't even let me deceive you. This is the critical part. Let no one deceive you. You should be reading your Bible, and everybody should be looking down at the Bible and says, I'm going to check this guy out. I'm going to check if he's not deceiving me, because that's what this says here. Let no one deceive you. Not me, not any pastor, not any teacher. For it will not come unless the apostasy, translated apostasy there, apostasia in Greek, fall in a way. And it's another translation, a rebellion. It will not come unless the rebellion, the apostasy, fall in a way. From faith, by the way, comes first. So that must come first. And the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself about every so-called God or object of worship displaying himself as being God. I think we, I noticed that one. Did it cut off for a moment? This one here? Oh, use this. Okay, very good. Thank you. That must be easier. Praise the Lord. All right. So do you see Paul is referring to the church? He's writing to Christians to say, look, you're going to know when it's about to come. Two things are going to happen before Jesus comes. Before he comes and we gather to him, two things will happen. It will be one will be the apostasy, comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed. After that, he explains the mystery of lawlessness, which is the, there's a mystery of godliness. Well, there's a mystery of lawlessness. 
It's the anti-mystery because he's the antichrist. He's the one who replaces Christ. And he talks about the restrainer. And the restrainer we believe, we believe is to be the Holy Spirit who will be restraining this man of sin from being revealed. But more or less, understand that the antichrist is coming. Little children, John says. Anti you heard that antichrist is coming. But he's already here, First John says. Many antichrists have already come and have gone on to the world. Even from the letters of John, many antichrists have come. It is no surprising the antichrists have come. You have them all around. Have them all around in, sometimes in the UN. Sometimes in the White House. Sometimes in Parliament. Sometimes in different countries. Turkey, Iran, Russia. And on and on from history on, we have many antichrists who have come into the world. Those who want to take the place of Christ. Those who want to take away the special place of Christ. And we have the mystery. We have this mystery because it has been operating in the world for quite a long time. It is the spirit of antichrist. And the spirit of antichrist is operating in the world. It is operating in the church for one purpose only. To remove the centrality of Christ away from your heart. It is trying to get us away from the centrality of Jesus. It's to tell us that Jesus is not that special. You don't have to have him. You don't need him. You can have anything else you want. You can have any other religion. That's the spirit of Antichrist. And it's operating in the church to move us away from the centrality of Jesus. To know that Jesus is special. That Jesus is the one. He is the anointed one. He's all we need. And Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist comes into the church and says, no, you don't need that. No, you don't need that. No, you don't need that. And he keeps pushing us away from God. Pushing us away from Jesus. But let's continue. Will the church face the Antichrist? Well, apparently, Paul says, there will be church. There will be Christians facing this man of lawlessness that is going to be revealed. So the falling away comes first. That is the text. The context is Paul is referring to the coming of Antichrist to replace Christ. And other texts in Scripture, including Revelation 15, tells us that. That there will be those who will overcome a, the beast, image, and his name. Now I want to turn something real quick because Revelation chapter 6 tells us something again about the coming of Antichrist. Let's go to Revelation 6 and we'll kind of develop this for a few minutes. And then we'll get back to overcoming because this is an important topic to realize that we're in the cusp of history. We're in the cusp of history of what will happen in the last days. People want to know. People pay a lot of money to go to psychics, to go to tarot card readings. Uh, I live not too far from Venice Beach in Hollywood. It is the capital of uh, tarot cards and psychics. I mean, every down the road, you know, palm reading, what's the future like? People pay a lot of money for it. I could save you a lot of money for that. It's all here. The Bible tells us what's going to happen. Revelation chapter 6, the Lamb broke the seals, verse 1. One of the seven seals, I heard one of the four living creatures saying, with the voice of thunder, come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. And he sat on it, had a bow and a crown given to him, and he went on to conquering and to conquer. Of course, he's talking about the Antichrist. He comes on a white horse. Everything is, remember, everything about Antichrist is trying to mimic Jesus. He'll have a, some type of resurrection experience, a wound to the head, and he'll come back to life. And people will admire him as if he's some kind of God and will worship him as he has overcome, it says, he has overcome all his enemies. He has over, even overcome death, apparently. Uh, seemingly at that time, he will have a white horse in this against the symbolism here. He will come to bring peace, but it says to conquer and to conquer. Now, this is, of course, the riders, the white horsemen, the, 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 the horsemen of the apocalypse. This is not the Democratic Party in the, in the USA, but they seemingly can be. I could understand that text from that perspective. The four horsemen of the apocalypse could be the Democratic Party coming soon. But anyway, it's not to get political. But it is to say there are other horses after that. There's the white one. But then in verse 5, he broke the third seal, and I come and said, Come, I heard the living creature saying, Come. And I looked, and behold, a black horse who got sounded had a pair of scales, and he was, as it were, a voice in the center of four living creatures, a quart of wheat for a denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius. Do not harm the oil into one. What is he talking about here? No doubt famines. Now, there's other horses. The red horse is war. Then there's a pale horse, which has diseases and things like that. But this, of course, is the black one, which has famine. Is the Antichrist connected to famines? And this is the critical part that I believe the scripture points to. And the answer is yes. In the, in the Old Testament, you have a picture of Joseph preparing 
the people and saving the world before the famine comes. But in, in Genesis chapter 38 and 39, it says very clear, everything, the economy, the resources, even the people, ended up under Pharaoh's control. It was handed to Pharaoh. Literally, people were selling themselves out to Pharaoh so they could be fed. So they could be fed. However, this idea of famines is not just found in Genesis and other parts of Scripture. Turn to the book of Acts, chapter 12, please. Acts, chapter 11, I'm sorry. Acts, chapter 11. We see this thing. Jacob talked about one of the Caesars uh, yesterday, one of the Caesars that's to come. In chapter 11, verse 28, Acts chapter 11, verse 28, we see this picture of famines again. One of the men named Agabus, he was a prophet, stood up and began to indicate by the spirit that will be a, certainly be a great famine all over the world. And this took place during the reign of Claudius. This, the famines, this is notated in Roman history, several famines during the reign of Claudius. Shortly after Claudius, guess who showed up? Nero. The Christians identified him as 666. Jacob talked about it yesterday. I'm not going to go over that. You should get that video when it comes out and watch it and be careful with it because absolutely jam-packed with truth and listen to it very carefully. But here we go. Claudius during famines, during Claudius' reign, we got Nero comes right after that. He takes control of the Roman Empire. Turn to chapter 12 very quickly, verse 20. Now, he was very angry with the people. He's talking about Herod. Another type, another figure, another major figure of the Antichrist. He was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and with one, and with one accord they came to him. And having one over blasted the king's chamber, uh, chamberlain, they were asking him for peace because the country was fed by the king's country. This is, again, there was a severe famine. Herod comes on the scene, just as like Nero did, and he takes over the food supply, and now he starts making deals with people for food for famine. This is again pictures of the Antichrist coming on the scene and saying, taking over the supplies. Here comes the white horse, then comes the black horse, famine. Do we ever see horses in those colors in other places of scripture? Yes. Turn to Zechariah chapter 6. Zechariah chapter 6. I'm going through this very quickly because I've got to get over all the material. If you have any questions after that, we can talk about it. If you want to watch it later, you can watch it later. Uh, but this is just for a lot of notes and a lot of highlighting because I'm going through very quickly. Normally, this would be one study for the entire time. Zechariah chapter 6, we have the four chariots. It says the angel in, um, in verse 1, I lifted up my eyes and I looked and behold, four chariots coming forth between two mountains. With the first chariot was red. Horses, second chariot, black horses, third chariot, white horses, fourth chariot, dapple horses, speckle or dapple, same idea. And I spoke to him, and the, and the angel was speaking to me. What are these, my Lord? And the angel said, these are the four spirits of heaven going forth after standing before the Lord of all the earth. With one of the black horses are going forth the north country. The white ones go after them, and the dapple goes to the south. Now, Revelation told us what these colors mean. The north is visited by the black horse. What's the black horse? Famines. Who goes after it? The white horse. Who's the white horse in Revelation? Antichrist. Follows the same pattern. You got a famine, you got Antichrist, and then you got the dapple horse going to the south. Now, this idea of white, dapple, black are found in Revelation, this idea of white and the black. The dapple and the white, it's something that you have to look at the Hebrew in this. This is very interesting. The word for white. In, in Hebrew, it's the word for Laban, Laban. We would say it in English, Laban. So you got Laban in the dapple, Laban in the dapple. Does anyone know a story in the Bible about some kind of conflict between the, a guy named Laban and dapple? Let's turn to Genesis, please. Turn to Genesis chapter 30. Genesis chapter 30, just to circle the wagons here, as it would be, that's the expression, the American expression goes. Genesis chapter 30. Genesis chapter 30, and of course, this is Laban's conflict with Jacob. Jacob, Israel, the white one, has a conflict, has a conflict with Jacob. But Laban said to him, if now pleases you stay, verse 27 of Genesis chapter 30. Laban said to him, or the white one says to him, 
If now it pleases you, stay with me. I have, div uh, I have divined that the Lord has blessed me on your account. And he continued, name me your wages and I'll give it to you. And he said to him, you yourself know that I have served you. Now your cattle have fared with me for you had little before I came and has increased to a multitude. And the Lord has blessed you whoever, wherever I turn. But now when, when shall I provide for my own household? So he said, I shall give you, uh, uh, what shall I give you? Jacob said, you shall not give me anything. You will do this one thing for me. I will again pasture and keep the flock. Let me pass through the entire flock today, removing every speckled, so we're dappled, spotted sheep, every black one from the lambs and every spotted speckle among the goats. Those shall be my wages. So he makes a deal with them. But that's not the first time he made a deal with Laban. Genesis 29. Genesis 29. This time it's not goats and sheep, it's wives. Verse 14, Laban said to him, Surely you are bone of my bones and my flesh. And he stayed with him a month. And Laban said to Jacob, verse 15, Because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall be your wages? Now Laban had two daughters. And then when the older was Leah, and the name of the younger one was Rachel. And Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was a beautiful form and face. Now Jacob loved Rachel so much, so I will serve you. Seven years, he makes a seven-year treaty with the white one, with Laban. But then what happens in verse 21? Then Jacob said to him, give me your wife, for my time is completed, that I might go into her. And Laban gathered all the men and, and for the place and made a feast. Now it came about in the evening that he took his daughter Leah and brought her to him, and Jacob went into her. And Laban also gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah was a maid. So he came about in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, what is it that you have done to me? Was it not Rachel and I served with you? Why then have you deceived me? Laban makes a deal for seven years and he breaks the treaty. There's no doubt these are connections to what the Bible speaks of ultimately what's going to happen to Israel. There will be a, some kind of treaty with the white one, Laban, the one comes in the white horse, somehow is connected to famine with the black going to the north. Now, if you want to make conjectures about what the north is, I believe it's the developed world. There's something coming to the northern hemisphere, to the northern part of the world, to the developed world. And there'll be a conflict between the north and the south, just like Daniel says. But the Antichrist will take advantage of that conflict and will overtake famines and will overtake the food supply so he can become like Pharaoh, so he could become like the Caesars, and he will begin to rule over people over food. This is something that the Bible speaks about many times. I believe it's connected to eventually coming of the 666 because there's going to have to be some kind of way to control what people eat, buy, sell, or trade. Now, I'm not saying this is for sure. I'm not saying this is what, uh, you know, Marco said it, that's it, that settles it. But it is to say we ought to look at the scriptures in a very careful manner to see if these patterns hold true. Now, let's go back to Revelation. Let's go back to Revelation 15. What do they overcome? Being a big U-turn to get to back to Revelation 15. What do they overcome? Revelation 15. They overcome the beast. Verse 15, verse 2. They overcome the number of his name. And they overcome his image. Now, what are these things? The beast is, of course, the Antichrist. The image has something to do with the religious system. It will be set up by the false prophet. That You have to worship the image of the beast. And the number of his name. 666. And literally, more than just the number, it's the idea of a man rising up to take God's place in people's heart. Basically, it's the ultimate rebellion of man to become like God. Six, it's the number of men, six, and six. Ultimate rebellion. God has his sevens, Antichrist has his six, and he triples it, and he becomes 666. as man basically ruling with authority with no regards to God whatsoever. Well, it doesn't hard to, not hard to imagine that actually people live like this already. With regard, no regard to God, no regard to anything holy, anything true, anything good. And they continue living as if God did not exist. My friend, I surely lived that way. I surely was my own 666. I surely was the elevated man in my own mind. But this is how people live. And God is going to give people what they ultimately want. They don't want God. They would want a man to rule over them. 666. 666. Antichrist will be in the place of Christ. And that's what is coming. But we have to identify this. We have to overcome truth and error. One of the things the Antichrist is going to do is he's going to sell a bill of goods. As if it is true. As if it's something true. 
It's false, but it's, it's, people are going to think it's true. And do we have the discernment to know what is truth and what is error? Is Jacob out, out of the room yet? He's still not in? Well, we're going to have to play without him. <laughs> um, we'll pl- I will hold off on this. How about that? I'll hold off on it. Maybe he'll come out. But false teaching regarding Christ, false teachings regarding the church, false teachings regarding the end times, false teaching regarding salvation, false teachings are in the church. Do we know what those are and are we able to overcome them through the word of God today? If we overcome them, we'll overcome them now, we'll overcome them later. Put it this way, there is already a false church in the world today. There's already a false church that's being developed and the spirit of Antichrist is in that. But you know what? The average person in London, the average person in the UK, would not see a difference between what we would say the true church and what, they say, what we would say the false church. They would say, that's the same thing. Same thing in China. You know, there's a false church and a true church. There's the underground church and then the, it's, it's a, the three self church that the, follows the government. And what the government says, they teach. And what the government says, don't teach, they don't teach. But the average person said, what's the big deal? I had a friend of mine, not a believer, went to China. He didn't believe me that there was persecution in China. Went there and he went to all these uh, three self-churches and they said, he came back and he says, there's no problem. Everybody got along great. Uh, the, 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 they had the Bible in the pulpit. People preached it. What are you talking about persecution? And I said, what do they teach? Well, you know, whatever they were saying. You know, I said, do you realize that the government tells them what to preach? And if they don't want, if they, the government says, don't preach about abortion, these churches don't preach about abortion or against abortion. If the church, if the, if the state doesn't want to talk about communism, they won't talk about communism. Now, who dictates that church? It's not God. It's not the spirit of God. It's Antichrist. Antichrist dictates what that goes on to those churches. It's the same thing today. It is the exact same thing today in the church. They won't talk about gay marriage, homosexuality. They won't talk about, uh, they won't come against abortion many times. They won't talk about the things of God. They won't talk about sin. They won't talk about holiness and righteousness and truth. Why? We might offend some people. We might offend men. We might offend the government. We might offend a lot of people. Antichrist. You're not being directed by God. You're not being directed by the Holy Spirit. Jacob came out. All right. Jacob, would you like to come up forward, please? (laughs) But this is what we have to overcome. Now, I set this out because I wanted Jacob to speak on this. Jacob, you know who this lady is? (laughs) All right. (laughs) As long as the church doesn't mention anything that goes against policy of the government, the church is going to be fine. But as soon as the church begins to preach and teach what God says, guess what's going to come? A conflict that's already in existence, but it's sort of underground at this point. It'll be made evident when that man of sin shows up. I was in the other room being interviewed for a Genesis TV. I didn't hear this, but I saw this. Augustus Caesar Augustus was the emperor when Jesus was born. Okay? What's unique about him is he was the first emperor who was deified in his lifetime. Others were deified posthumously. He was called God by the Roman Senate when he was alive. Caesar Augustus, a major type of the Antichrist. Tiberius was the emperor during most of the lifetime and ministry of Jesus, okay? Caligula was somebody who was out of his mind. (laughs) He was completely out of his mind, a total madman, a total madman. Connected to the Democrats. Yeah. (laughs) Claudius was different than the other emperors. They were all bisexual. He was purely homosexual. He was the one who kicked the Jews out of Rome because of the riots over Christ, over Christos, that's probably Jesus. That's right. And then, of course, Nero, who we looked at last night, burned Rome, killed the apostles. These all are types of the Antichrist, especially Caesar Augustus and Nero. After Nero, you had a series of other emperors who tried to wipe out both Christianity and the Jews. Not just Titus, you had, who was a general who became emperor, Septimus Severitus, Marcus Aurelius, uh, Decius, Diocletian. All of these men were demon-possessed, sexually perverted, 
and animated by Satan to try to destroy the church, and they all had an antichrist spirit. They all put themselves in a place of being a deity. That's right. And that's what they did. Okay, now I don't know what Marco was saying about them, but I came out and that's what was up there, so that's what I'm talking about. You know this lady, Jacob? Let, let, yeah, she's a... Uh, oh, God. She sends her... <laughs> she sends her regards. I, but I wanted to... I pity the poor bloke who took her to the prom. <laughs> Let's Go play ahead. a video for you. This is at the Toronto Gay Festival 2019. There were some Christians who were witnessing, and uh, she came out in defense of the LGBT um, parade, and she had some uh, interesting things to say. Um, just you be the witness. Let, I'm not going to tell you what she said. She'll tell you what she says, and we'll have her brother Jacob here um, comment on her wonderful explanations <laughs> of Romans chapter 1. Do you read Greek? Right. Do you read, do you read Koine Greek? Because you, I actually do read Koine Greek. Okay, so what does it say in the Greek? You can read any no, translation. No, this is important. Yeah. What does it say in Greek? Uh, which, which passage? Romans, Romans, chapter, Romans 1, chapter, one, chapter 1, where it says that, uh, I would say the second half of the okay. chapter. Yeah, that, where, the second half of Romans what does it say chapter 1 is actually a very complicated point of interpretation because Paul appears to be speaking in quotation marks here and primarily speaking about um, Roman, Roman customs as opposed to Jewish customs. What he's addressing may be temple prostitution. Um, certainly some of what he's addressing is heterosexuals engaging in non-reproductive sex practices. He certainly had issues with that. Paul did not have the same understanding of sexual orientation or committed same-sex partnerships that we do. Um, on the other hand, most of the passages which are taken as a condemnation of homosexuality are based on disputable translations of words which are often hapax logomena okay. and whose understanding we, we do not, we can't fully translate with accuracy. Can I ask you a question? Do you support uh the month of June's uh, celebration of gay pride. I do. I have seen in the lives of same-sex couples, which I know, um, the fruits of the spirit. I have seen loyalty. I have seen sacrificial love. I have seen Christian lives much better than my own. And I believe that as with Peter and the Gentiles, when I witness the fruits of the spirit in the lives of committed same-sex partners, many of whom are Christians, then I respect that as demonstrating an extension, an extension of how we have understood the gospel, as widening our understanding of Do what is Do you support uh, gay pride parades? Yes, I, I, that... I attend. Okay, I march so, in the pride on, one parade. Second, yeah. One second. Yes. Uh, so what about when people come out here and they have uh, these parades, yeah. uh, do you not witness the other unspeakable acts of debauchery, drunkenness, celebration of wickedness? There's all kinds. It's not just uh, even a celebration of gay you're pride. You're having anymore. much more fun at Pride than I am, I think. No, I'm not even going to Pride, but I've seen the videos of just uh, people dressing very lewd. Children ways and they're dressing their children up and celebrating this lewdness and a small number and of sexual people a small number of right? people are lightly dressed i am not particularly concerned about that it's a particular context the majority of people at the pride parade are just wearing ordinary do you believe our bodies clothes. are temples of the holy spirit and then we're supposed to keep our bodies holy as god is holy uh yes i think i have a different interpretation of what, what it means to keep your body holy keeping our body holy. we share I, that with us Acting with love, with integrity, with service to the poor, with loyalty, with all of these things. Okay, but what about the sin that we commit with our bodies against God? I think the worst sin we commit with our bodies against God right now is our indulgence of our appetite for fossil fuels, which is destroying the planet. I think that's that good, that's putting, really your, putting your body in a car and going, I'm going to drive my car, is a way that's worse a really sin than you, any you, sexual what is practice. What is what is How do we overcome this? We overcome them with the truth. But to have the discernment between truth and error, lots of error there. But I wanted Jacob to comment on that because I think he does it so well, especially regarding Romans 1 in the Greek text, which he mentioned. I watched this once before, and I discussed it with Marco by Skype. He was in California. I was somewhere else and we discussed it by Skype. But this is the second time I've seen this ridiculous thing. First of all, 
what you're looking at is the Jezebel spirit incarnate. You see her trying to imitate a pastor or a vicar by dressing in religious robes and things like this. This is Matthew 23 stuff that Jesus mocked. Then people were using religious garb to set themselves above the people. Nicolaitanism. Now you have a woman putting herself into the position. So you have a perversion of a perversion. <laughs> you have the Jezebel spirit. Leadership is male. Then you have the pretext of academic superiority based on her knowledge of Koine Greek. Do you read Koine Greek? Well, as a matter of fact, I happen to be able to read Koine Greek. And the term, as I said earlier, hieros gamos is not in Romans 1. The term for temple prostitutes and temple prostitution is not even in the text. Secondly, she uses the term hapex legemina, a term that which means a word is only used once in scripture, and she just says, we can't be sure what it means. Uh, remember the crooked lawyer? Yeah. <laughs> Amplifying something ambiguous out of context to the negation of the greater context? Well, in fact, we have the Septuagint, and we have the classic literature. Something may be hapex legemini, but that is not to say we cannot define what it means. From the Iliad and the Odyssey to the Septuagint, we have volumes of classic literature that uses that same vocabulary, and you can know largely what a word meant in its popular usage, even though it's hapex legemini. So her Greek is either A, not that good, or B, she's lying. Or C, a combination of the two, which is what I essentially lean towards. Okay. Now she says, Paul has a different definition than we do. You've got to understand what these people think. They think the church wrote the Bible so the church can rewrite it. It's not the word of God, it's the word of the church. In her case, of course, the word of the apostate church. We can read, they, that, can, that thinks we can rewrite it. It's not divine revelation. Secondly, the, additionally, the emphasis on Romans is not about unnatural or perverted sexual acts heterosexually. It is speci specifically highlighting acts of a lesbian or homosexual of the same-sex relationship nature. Specifically, they leave the natural affection for the man, for the woman. It's specifically in the context, that's what it says. She's not dealing with the text objectively. She's perverting the text subjectively. She's putting on a pretense of some kind of academic superiority and knowledge that's not there. I have a lot of friends who are Christian medical doctors. God bless every one of them. But I don't need them to tell me if I have a fever. You don't have to be a theologian or a Greek scholar to know what Romans chapter 1 is talking about. As Bob Dylan sang when I was a kid, you don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. You don't have to be a meteorologist to know what's cold outside. Or whatever the case. This is an absurd pretense. Now look at the image. She tries to reinforce it. She tries to reinforce it with the collar. If you are sick and you go to casualty, or you, you know, and in America it's called an emergency room, okay, and a physician comes in with, with a white coat and, 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 and a stethoscope around their neck, that is the image of somebody who knows what they're doing and they know what they're talking about. The very sight of somebody coming in with a stethoscope around their neck inspires a degree of confidence that this person knows what they're doing. <laughs> this person is somebody I need to talk to and listen to. Just by virtue of the fact that they come in with the stethoscope around their neck, it gives a sense of security to a patient. Every physician knows this. Every physician knows this and understands it. You can even see a change in the physical expression of somebody when a nurse walks out and a doctor walks in. That's just the way it is. She's doing the same thing with the collar. She's trying to present herself as somebody you can be confident in because of the way she looks. 
except she doesn't know anything. <laughs> Yet pretends she does. The term temple prostitute is not found in Romans 1. Heidel's gamos, Heidel's delphos, those terms are not in the text. They're not in the text. How can that be what it's talking about when it's not in, even in the text? Hey, Pex Legemina, oh, it, you got a word only found one time in Romans? Uh, is it in the Septuagint? Is it in the classical literature? We can't know what it is. It's only used in Scripture once. Oi, vavoy. <laughs> Oi, vavoy. What used to be, now there's chemical formulas, that are, those chemical terms that are much longer. But uh, at one time, the longest word in the English dictionary was anti-disestablishmentarianism. Yeah. It was a theological term. It was a theological term, anti-disestablishmentarianism. It meant you were against people who wanted to disestablish the church and separate the church from the state, and you oppose such people. It was a theological term, anti-disestablishmentarianism. Okay. Does that mean if you never heard this term, you can't find out what it means? That because somebody used it once in the first, no, you can go easily find out what it means. Hey, Pex Legemina is not undefinable. It's not, it does not mean something is undefined. It simply means it's only used once in scripture. It doesn't mean it's only used once. It's an absurd argument that she's making. Yet the pretense of the image. She's got the collar, you know, she's, she's got the clerical collar, and she's trying to inspire, I know what I'm doing, and I studied Greek, you know. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Now, where that kind of thinking did work, ironically, was in Catholic countries among rural populations, in places like Ireland, and Italy and Poland, when the priest said something, oh, that's a priest, he must be right. That, that was the thinking of, of people in, in, in Catholic cultures in, in, in the poorer and less educated Catholic countries, okay? That's the model she's using. That's the model she's using, only she's using it transsexually. The whole thing is absurd. Oh, that's why. Love with our bodies. I don't think I have the same understanding what Paul does. Well, how do you do that? Well, <laughs> what's the sin? Oh, no, the sin is not what the text says. The sin is driving a, a gas-guzzling vehicle. <laughs> Now look, God put man on the earth to take care of it. I'm concerned about pollution. I want clean air and clean water. I believe in conservation. But I look at countries like Germany, where they tried to go to complete renewables with the wind... They have driven the cost of electric and gas and heating bills through the roof. The sun does not always shine. The wind does not always blow. They've got thousands and thousands of these things. They're about 30 miles where Marco lives, going towards Palm Springs, and they hardly ever spin. And when they do, it freaks the birds out. <laughs> Not only that, they're not pretty like the traditional windmills in Holland. Yeah. They're eyesores. Yeah. Uh, now, if there's a place for it, I'm not against it. But it hasn't done anything for the countries that have done it. It hasn't done anything for Germany. You still become reliant on fossil fuels, and you're paying for two systems. You're still paying for the fossil fuel system and for the renewable system. You've made energy costs go higher, but you've not addressed or solved the basic problem. The people who invented smokeless coal helped the problem. Okay. The people who 
invented technology to use natural gas in a vehicle instead of uh, petroleum. So there's been credible people who did things scientifically and technologically, electric cars and so forth. But where's the electricity coming from? <laughs> you got to get it somewhere. We're going to get it from the wind. No, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. You might get some of it at a high cost, but you're not going to get all of it. I saw so Israel. You've all been to Israel, most of you, right? Israel, you see the solar racks on every house. They use the sun as much. That's fine, but it's still backed up by boilers. Yep. You cannot do this. It just doesn't work. And they think it's a sin. <laughs> Good Lord. <laughs> That's the main sin against God. Where is pollution reducing the most? The United States. When I was a kid, London was a mess because of the coal mixed with the fog. London was unbelievable. When I was a little kid, London was a terrible place. They cleaned it up, didn't they? <laughs> They cleaned it up, didn't they? Address the problem logically and scientifically. But to try to make it a religious crusade to build windmills and stuff, these people are crazy. And if you don't, you're against God. Oh, my Lord. There's the Christian socialists. If you don't believe in socialism, you don't believe in brotherhood, you're not a true Christian. The early Christians held all goods in common. There's people who teach this. Yep, that's right. That we should consume less to give more away, says Ron Sider, an evangelical author from Oxford. There's Christians who teach this stuff. Okay. Well, the fact of the matter is, somebody's got to pick up the tab. Capitalism, for all of its faults and warts, and it has plenty has given a higher standard of living to the most people. Socialism has never worked anywhere. It has lowered the standard of living of people everywhere. In the book of Acts, it was a temporary provision. When you had the church growing like wildfire and all these people coming from other countries for the pilgrim feasts and getting saved, what are you going to do with them? Now, if Jesus Christ told you that your hometown was going to be destroyed, would you put your house on the market? <laughs> they knew Jerusalem was going to get leveled by the Romans. Jesus told them. Of course they begin selling up. But they don't take that into account. Neither do they take into account that the church reached the point with the martyrdom of Stephen that God put an end to the collectivism. That's it right. was only a temporary provision. It got to the point where it made the church stagnant in its mission. God used the persecution to get the church going, and with it, the collectivism ended. But they only take certain scriptures that suit them out of context to construct a false theological argument. That's what you see this woman is doing. That is the school of thought, or I should say, the absence of thought. <laughs> that she's coming from. It's the Jezebel spirit, and it is the Hinduistic concept of nature worship and Mother Earth worship, the deification of the creation being confused with the creator. It's a Hinduistic concept coming into the church. But she's got the collar and she reads Greek, so you... <laughs> Trust me, I'm a Jezebel. <laughs> Thanks, Brother Jacob. <laughs> Revelation chapter 15, verse 3. I think I lost my signal, but we're going to finish this. <laughs> Come wind, rain. Thank you, brother. That was good. 
Jacob does these cameos for me sometimes, so that's a good thing. <laughs> How do we overcome these things? Remember, we have to overcome. We have to overcome sin, false teachings, the truth, and error. We have to overcome the reality of these errors in the church. But look at 15 verse 3. How do they overcome? They sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, O God, O Lord God, the Almighty, righteous and true in your ways, O King of the nations. They realize that God is who he is in his true character, in his true knowledge of truth. He is the God of truth. He is the Almighty, and they're not going to fall for anything else besides what God's truth is. They sang that song because God is true, and God is wonderful, and God has got an incredible character. He's the God Almighty. And sometimes the gospel is confused, like we talked about with Jacob. He talked about these... Um, false gospels and false messages. Yet these people on the other side of the crystal sea are saying, great and marvelous are your works, O oh God, your true character, you're righteous, you're true, and we're not going to fall for anything else. Turn to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. We're just going to go very quickly and finish off here. Luke chapter 11. Jesus spoke of these things regarding the enemy, the evil one. Luke chapter 11, verse 21. Luke chapter 11, verse 21. It tells us this, when a strong man is fully armed, guards his own homestead, his possessions are undisturbed. But when someone stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him, that's that word, overcome, same word, he takes away from him all his armor in which he had relied and distributes his plunder. Now take a look at this. He's speaking of Satan, of course. He's speaking of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit that the, the, the Pharisees had just done. But he says, stronger than the enemy. Who's stronger than the enemy is Christ. Christ overcomes the enemy, plunders the enemy, takes his armor, takes his weapons. What are Satan's weapons? Does Satan have weapons? Absolutely he does. One of the major weapons he uses, especially against Christian, is that you can believe the right thing and live totally, completely different. That's one of the major weapons of Satan, that you can believe the right things, and yet your life is contrary to what you believe in, and it's still okay. And he uses that weapon, but who can overcome that is Christ. He overcomes him. He overpowers him, takes away the weapons, takes away the armor, and that's why people can sing on the other side of the crystal sea, great and marvelous are your works, O God, because you have destroyed the false gospel. You have destroyed the false teaching. You have destroyed the false church. You have destroyed all these things that are against us. But we have to overcome. He overcame. We will overcome. And it's not on the slide because it's not working. We can only overcome through Jesus Christ. It's the only way. Turn to Revelation chapter 3. We'll stay on Revelation for the remainder of it. Revelation chapter 3 verse 21. We read this earlier. But it's the promise. Revelation 3.21, it says this to the church of Laodicea, He who overcomes, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He overcame, and he got to sit on his father's throne. You overcome, and you will sit with Christ on his throne. The overcoming is the most beautiful part about the end of Revelation. It's those who overcome are sitting with Christ on his throne. They will sit with him. They will, he will be granted to him. Uh, John chapter 16, verse 33. In this world, you will have tribulation. But do not fear. Do not worry. Right? Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Right? It's the world. How did he overcome it? Revelation 17. Look again. Revelation 17, verse, 20, uh, verse 12. Revelation 17, verse 12. This is what the Antichrist is going to do. This is his final plan. This is his final battle against Christ. And ten horns, which you saw, are ten kings who have not yet received the kingdom. Revelation 17, 12. But they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. These have one purpose, and they give the power and authority to the beast. They will wage war against the lamb, and the lamb will overcome them, because he is the Lord of lords and king of kings, and those who are with them are called and chosen and faithful. You see all those three things? Called, chosen, faithful. He will overcome them. What is this talking about? Of course, is Daniel 7. There will be these four 
beast that Daniel saw in the last one comes and he's got ten horns and Daniel wants to know what's going on this beast looks totally different than the other ones finally Daniel's told or he sees in verse 13 the son of man coming the son of man coming Daniel sees the ten horns and, and he sees finally he's told that in verse 13 that is the one who overcomes the beast the fourth beast is the son of man coming in the clouds glory and power he sees Jesus coming and he looks at those beasts and he can't imagine those beasts being overcome by anything except Jesus Christ except Jesus Christ that's what it says in verse 14 he overcame them the lamb overcame them now look at this Daniel says there's beast there's he sees a leopard he sees a bear he sees a, a, a creature that he can't even describe what what overcomes him is it a terrible animal a ferocious beast a lamb what's the character of the lamb one who lays down his life one who gives up his life for his friends it is the gospel it is a message of love that God so loved the world that he gave his only son as a lamb to the slaughter he came to bring us life to forgive us from sin and he overcame them the lamb did he overcame them and in Revelation chapter 5 where everything's standing around the lamb says I saw a lamb stand uh, standing as if he was slain in the center of all the universe and center of God's throne it's a lamb as if I've been slain the one who destroys the kingdom is a lamb the one who overcomes the world is a lamb the one who will overcome the world overcome sin and overcome the system of this world will be those in the character of the lamb Turn to Revelation chapter 21. Again, Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, verse 6. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, beginning and the end. I will, give the, uh, I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cause. He who overcomes shall inherit these things. I will be his God, and he will be my son. They overcame him. Revelation chapter 12, just to finish off, this is a famous passage, verse 11. This is about those who Satan goes after, the persecution, Revelation 12, 11. And they, people of God, they overcame him. Do you get the feeling that Revelation is about overcoming? Yes. It should be the overwhelming theme. People make it about all kinds of different things. I think it's clear. It's about overcoming. Faith in Christianity is about overcoming overcoming sin overcoming our own sin overcoming the world and the lust of the world overcoming false teachings and false doctrines that are in the church recognizing the truth having the discernment to know and ultimately we will overcome the spirit of Antichrist and the beast himself they overcame him the dragon the beast that dragon that comes after the woman long to explain but you'll have to Maybe you get Jacob CDs on that one. They overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb, because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life unto death. The blood of the Lamb, again, the Lamb, his death. And they did not love their life even unto death. They were willing to give up their lives. They were willing to uh, give their lives up for the sake of Jesus Christ. They didn't love their lives even in the face of death. Why? Jesus had done that, didn't he? You can say this thing about Jesus. He did not love his life until death. He was willing to lay it down. Total willingness and submission. And you know, Satan can say to God, you know what? Yes, Jesus did that. But Jesus is special. Jesus is special. He, he could do that. And God can say, no. Not only he could do that, but there will be a people that will be in the character of the Lamb who will be willing to give up their lives for the love of Christ, who will be willing to even lay down their own lives and not deny his name for the sake of him who called us and loved us and hung on that cross for us. Satan cannot understand that. Satan knows that a man will give anything for his life. He can't imagine because he's full of lies and hate and evil. He can't imagine that somebody can love God that much. Do we love God that much? Well, somebody's going to do it. People do it today. Why, there's been tremendous love for Christ that even unto death, we will not deny his name. My friend, only in this life, only in this life, you'll have the privilege of carrying the cross of Jesus. That's it. Only this life, you'll have the privilege of carrying the cross of Jesus. Once we get to the other side of the crystal sea, you won't have to carry the cross. But you have the privilege today of carrying his cross. 
Oh, Simon did it. Simon carried the cross, but would you? Would you carry the cross even unto death? You know, our brothers and sisters in many places of the world have to get through this. We haven't endured that. But the Bible says, he who overcomes, we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb. They believed. They believed the fact that they're even persecuted is because of God, but because of Christ's sake, they were being persecuted. Now the question comes up, Pastor, doesn't the Bible say that the Antichrist will overcome the saints? Daniel 7, 21, Revelation 13? Yeah. So who overcomes who? Does the Antichrist overcome the saints of God? Or do we overcome the Antichrist, the beast in his image? The answer is he might kill the body, but we will ultimately overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. He might take this body, but he won't take away our faith. He may touch this external patch of flesh, but he'll never take away our faith. He'll never take our heart for God. And that's what God is looking for, a people for his own name that will love him even unto death. My friend, we're, deep, we're dealing with some deep things here, some things that we never thought about in our comfortable Christian faith. We might never cross our mind, sitting here in the UK safe and comfortable, that this is the plight of many Christians today. In fact, the majority of Christians today. But yet, this is what the Bible says, you will overcome. Remember, those who overcome, eternal life. Those who overcome, to sit with God. Those who overcome, tree of life. Those who overcome, one with Christ, the morning star. Don't you want that? Yeah. But what is it going to take? Overcome. Does it mean I have to go through this? No, but we must be willing to. Yeah. If called upon, if called upon. This is the perseverance of the saints. Revelation 13. This is the perseverance of the saints. I'll leave you with this because this is the last passage here. This is the perseverance of the saints. Verse 10. If anyone's destined into captivity, into captivity he goes. If anyone's killed by the sword, with the sword he must be killed. Here's the perseverance and the faith of the saints. What is this? The context is the world is sinful. And the world is heading only one direction. And God will give over the world into the hands of the Antichrist. Can you and I stop that? No. It's what God says he will do. Now the question is, my friend, do you trust him? Do you trust him with that? That God says he will give power and authority to the beast. And you and I cannot stop that. It's his word. It's the truth. Here's the faith and perseverance of the saints. Do you trust him in that? That even as the Bible says, I'm not saying if he does it, when he does it, that he wins, that you win, that you will overcome, even with that dreadful news that maybe, maybe shrieks your soul right now and says, oh no, you can't do that, God, you can't do that, you can't do that. Yes, he will, because God has to show the world if they want Antichrist, they'll get Antichrist and they'll see what's about. They don't want him. They don't want him in schools. They don't want him in hospitals. They don't want him in the law courts. They don't want him in any place. God says he'll stop restraining and the world will get antichrist. And do you trust him? Would you remain in the faith, my friend? Even when that time comes, here's the faith and perseverance of the saints to trust God no matter what happens in the next hundred years, you would trust him even with your life. The world thinks like Babylon, gold, power, strength, might, Christians, we don't think like that. We think like the Lamb. We think like Jesus Christ. Even if I carry the cross all the way to the end. 1 John 2 tells us, young men, says, I write to you because the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Isn't that wonderful news? Even death, my friend, cannot stop you from overcoming. Not even death can stop you from overcoming. Why? Because Jesus the Lamb has gone ahead of you and he has overcome. But we must be in his character, the character of the Lamb, faithfulness even unto death. What a tall order, isn't it? We've gone through some deep things. Jacob has expounded on some things about truth and error. We've come to that point where we go, Lord, if we're going to trust you, but you know what? You can choose today to walk in the Spirit and overcome sin today. And if you're overcoming sin today, you will overcome when that man of sin shows up. You don't have to worry about that day. Would you overcome? Are you overcoming now? If you're overcoming now, 
you don't have to worry about overcoming them because you already are by the blood of the Lamb and you will overcome unto eternal life. It's not what you do, but what he does in you. My friend, would you trust him today that he will overcome whatever is in your life, he will overcome. And through him, you will overcome even unto death. What an amazing passage of Revelation. Overcome. Christianity is about overcoming, my friend. There's no doubt about it. Let's pray. Father, we've touched on some deep things, Lord. And maybe there's even unbelief in our own hearts that this is not for me. And I shouldn't be here. And I shouldn't listen to this. And I didn't understand most of it. But Lord, I pray that whatever was clear, whatever was made right and clear, would be from your spirit into our souls, into our heart, into our spirit. Lord, I thank you that you give us your word. You give us the truth, Lord, and you gave us hope for eternal life. He who overcomes. Lord, we want to overcome. Help us, Lord God, to overcome today. Help us to overcome, Lord, our own sins, our own carnality, our own flesh. And help us to live by the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit, and will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Please, Lord God, help us to overcome the world and its lust and its power and its glimmer and its glitter and its hype and all the things that it calls upon us to remove Jesus from the very center of our worship and of our hearts. Oh Lord, Antichrist is coming. It truly is already in the world. That spirit that wants to dethrone Christ from our hearts. Lord, please, by your spirit, help us to overcome now. So Lord, if we're called upon, like in Revelation 12 and 13 and 15, we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb. In Jesus, our Lord, amen. Thank you for letting me share. God bless you guys.